Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. America's export of soybeans helps the U.S. maintain a positive agricultural trade balance. Nebraska contributes half of its soybeans for export. The protein and oil content in soybeans enhance the growing demand for higher protein diets. The Nebraska Soybean Board promotes research to develop new soybean varieties with higher protein and oil content for major agricultural markets. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. This week, Elaine Cub from the ARC Group is our marketing analyst. UNL Extension Ford Specialist Bruce Anderson updates us on pasture conditions. Kim Stackhouse Lawson from the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State talks with us about animal welfare issues. And Emily Dorn reports on E85 usage in vehicles across the state. Elaine Cub from the ARC Group is our marketing analyst this week. We talked with Elaine on Friday morning about the latest in corn and soybean markets. It's been a relatively favorable week overall. You look at the stock market, we're getting unemployment benefits that match a four-year low. S&P has reached 1400 for the first time since 08. Banks are in good shape. And then if we go to the grain side, corn did okay this week, but soybeans really ran away. So what is the diagnosis there? Yeah, everything like you say, macroeconomically speaking, things are very favorable. If you talk about our customers, China, their economic ability to pay their futures prices have reached record highs this past week. So this has been a big week for grains, absolutely, and, and soybeans have been the leader. Ch China's been in the news for rumors nonetheless, but soybeans, is it time to unload old crop? Well, I think uh, most farmers with a lot of risk management, you know, some strategic conservati mm -hmm. conservatism there, probably have a lot of their old crop grain already sold. What I've been recommending is that guys keep, you know, a few loads around basically as gambling bushels because I suspect we could be entering another summer, particularly for corn, where it's going to get very tight and you're going to see record high basis levels or record strong basis levels. So I would recommend whatever you're still hol holding on to, you continue to hold on to because I don't think that we've seen this rally end yet. There's been no sign that the rally has ended just Yet. You think there's still more space? I think there might be, and, and I, I think of it more in terms of time than in as, a, as a price level. I think we've got another couple of weeks here before we really start to pay attention to new crop bearishness. So I think there's still another week or a week and a half where we could get another 10 or 15 cents in these markets. Yeah, speaking of new crop, when is it time to start really thinking about forward contracting out for soybeans? Um, I've already started some sales earlier this month, and I think it will make sense to look at making some more sales before the end of the month because we have that prospective plantings report right. coming up. And especially for soybeans, because they have, have had this run since mid-February. They have benefited over corn. The price ratio is now about 2.3 to 1 for the new crop contracts. And that's probably a lot higher than it needs to be. I think soybeans are going to receive acres whether they buy them this month or not. You know, I think that farmers are more likely to stick to their usual rotations, stick to what seed is available than the USDA has previously been predicting. Yeah, planning intentions, March 30th. It's a Friday. How many acres can we put you down for? Well, I think that the 94 million acre number for corn is, is much too large. I don't think that there's going to be that big of a change in, in farmer planting behavior. I think it will be probably closer to 93. Last year we had 92. They will probably gain some because of these prices, but I don't think it's going to be anywhere near as bearish as, as USDA has been predicting. And so in that, with that in mind, what do you see in corn for the next two weeks then and probably the week after? Well, I think that it's, it has been slightly competing with soybeans, you know, that it will probably continue to, to work toward that $6 level over the mm -hmm. next two weeks. And if we do get a surprise in that plantings report, then we've got another a big rally to look forward to after that. One thing that's kept rising steadily is gas prices, energy prices, and in so doing, input costs. Uh, what do you think is going to happen here? And, and we were talking before, and obviously it's an election year, so there are things that could happen as we get into September, November. But right now, what do you think for energy prices going forward. Well, let's look at crude oil as a benchmark for energy as a whole. And I would say that $110 level, $115 level, a lot of that was just risk premium because of the uncertainty about Iran. And we've got a month that we know Iran and Israel aren't going to do anything because they've said they're going to wait till their meeting next month. 
So it seems like things might just kind of skate along here. And longer term, on its own, energy market is has a fairly decent supply and demand situation. We're not increasing our demand as fast as, as the demand or as the supply is staying constant. So I think that there's there's some reason for long-term bearishness in oil prices or in energy prices, particularly natural gas here in the United States. But in the short term, gosh, you really don't want to be short in that market because you never <laughs> know what these Middle Eastern countries are going to do. You know, if we go back two months, where corn and soybean prices are now, are you surprised at the run that they've made, especially soybeans, really? Yes, very much so. And I think the reason I'm so surprised is because we knew about this South American drought mm -hmm. for several months now. You know, it seemed like it was already priced in and it has been priced in and nothing new has really happened. This whole run up of the past month, none of that was new information. We knew they had a drought and they're just now getting into harvest where we can really get reliable numbers about what the production is going to be from down there. So it's funny to me that, that the rally just continued and we had the funds continue to build up more and more of their net long position, but that puts you at a precarious situation. So if something does change, how fast is it going to fall apart? Next week, we'll take another look at corn and bean markets with Roy Smith. We've learned from UNL research that agricultural real estate values jumped 31% in the last year. This is the largest increase in the 34-year history of UNL's Nebraska Farm Real Estate Survey. As we look forward at potential concerns on that expensive land, moisture comes to the front. We've covered soil moisture issues in the past, and this week we talked with UNL Extension Forage Specialist Bruce Anderson about how chances for a drought this year could affect pastures and rangeland in Nebraska. A drought is always possible, uh, but if we take a look at uh, what happened in the southern regions uh, the past year or two, we, we see that a lot of times it, it creeps up on us when we least expect it. And uh, uh, we certainly are, are on the fringe of the area where the drought was pretty severe this past year. And if it creeps uh, much further than where it did last year, we could be right in the midst of it. Let's talk about right now, conditions right now. What are the ranges, what are the pastures like? Well, I think we see that at least on the surface, uh, things look pretty good. We, we've had moisture over the winter and the surface uh, moisture is looking fairly decent uh, in many areas. Uh, but there's a lot of regions where when you start getting down to the subsoil, start getting down two feet, three feet deep, uh, we start getting quite a bit drier and we haven't had a full recharge of the soil's water holding capacity. So we're, we're sitting at, at kind of a, a balancing point here where if we don't have uh, abundant or at least the normal spring rains, uh, we're gonna be going into the heat of summer with, with possibly possibly a little less rain and a little less moisture than what we normally would have. Now how much is the variation across the state? Is it is it vast? It, it's not a real huge variation. Uh, we've certainly been fortunate over the last uh, uh, year or two in the western part of the state of having uh, quite a bit mm -hmm. more rain in most areas than what we normally do. The eastern part has had some areas where we've been just uh, on the edge. In fact uh, before uh, uh, this snow back in February we were kind of sitting on a point where we were abnormally dry but that snow brought us back up to a moisture level where it was okay, uh, but we're still not going to be very far away from a point where uh, a drought could begin very quickly for us. So let's play out that scenario then. If there is a drought, what do you advise producers to do then and, and probably now leading up to? That's right, and I think that key you said there is that now part there because really if we start making our plans after we're in the middle of a drought, which we never know when we are in the middle of that drought until it's too late, uh, it will be just that. It'll be too late to really do many of the things that we want to do. So we've got to be identifying ahead of time and always should have planned ahead of time what, what our drought actions might be in terms of how we handle the livestock, how we handle the, the forage resources that we have, uh, how we manage those resources. So let's say if pastures dry out, what are some of the, the other options that producers can look at? Well, there's a number of things we can do from a pasture standpoint or a forage standpoint. One could simply be uh, that in the springtime, early summer, uh, reserve some lands that we might even plant to more drought hardy crops like some of the summer annual grasses like sorghum sedan grass or the millets so that we have that available for us uh, to use as a forage resource if we need and can use it for grazing or cutting for hay. Uh, other things that we can do is make sure that right from the very start we're in, in a good grazing management program. One where we're using rotational grazing, uh, adequate rest uh, and, and grazing periods so that the grass 
grass will be healthy, we'll have a deep rooting situation that will be able to use all the moisture we may potentially have there. And, and also in particular, well, where many producers may break their herd up into several small groups for breeding purposes or other reasons in the spring, getting them all back together into one large herd uh, and having higher stock density and more portions of the pasture resting and recovering after every grazing event will help grow more forage and help extend our grazing capabilities through the year. Because of, in part, the drought down south, a lot of the forages have moved down south and some cattle have moved up north. So it, when people start thinking about how expensive it's going to be to feed not only the spring but into the summer, what are some things to keep in mind there, some pointers for you know, cattle producers out there? So simply having the right animal numbers uh, that our forage can support is it, probably one of the most important things for us to be doing and not be overstocked and end up with suddenly pressure to have to go out and buy something that's extremely expensive. Later in the show, we'll see if any chances for moisture are in store when Al forecasts the coming week. Last week, we talked with Rick Rasby about caring for bulls during calving. This week, we asked UNL Extension Beef Genetic Specialist Matt Spangler what tips farmers and ranchers should keep in mind when buying their next bull. Well, they need to think about the traits that are relevant economically to their operation, be it weaning weight, yearling weight, carcass measurements, and then use the tools that do the best job at actually depicting the genetic differences. And of course, those are EPDs or expected progeny differences. Uh, for multiple trait selection, producers can use economic index values. And of course, now we have some DNA technology available, but what producers need to realize is that is already incorporated into the EPD for many breeds, particularly Angus right now, so they can just focus on the EPDs and they'll be able to do the best job at actually selecting the sire that fits their operation. Transitioning from one area of the beef industry to another, a few weeks ago we talked with Kim Stackhouse Lawson from the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State about progress made in animal welfare. So I think the major cultural change that has been the most positive in the beef industry is really the shift um, from taking injection sites from the rump to injection sites in the neck. And that's something that has been extremely positive and it's something that has shifted in the entire culture of the industry. So I mean, at, at this point, when people think about giving mm -hmm. shots, it's, it's immediately in the neck, they know four-year-olds know, three-year-olds know. Um, you know, so that, that's a really positive cultural shift that is, is more food safety related, but we need to talk about the same kinds of shifts when we talk about animal welfare. What are the things going forward that you think are the cultural shifts, or how many should people target per year to try and to fix maybe the perceptions that animal welfare is out there? Right, so animal welfare is a huge topic, and there are many issues that we could, you know, talk about and talk about and talk about until we're blue in the face. But really, the producers should try to pick two to three um, animal welfare issues. Some of the low-hanging fruit are, you know, castrating calves at an earlier age, dehorning calves at an earlier age, mm -hmm. guaranteeing um, heifers into feedlots as being open. You know, real basic things and two to three things a year to sort of target and try to change your operations culture to where that is just something innate that you know that you do. On this show we've talked a lot about you know, the two different sides, the animal welfare groups that try to go way to the extremes and mm -hmm. show things that are probably fairly uncommon. But on the other side of that, how do you protect yourself? As, as a member of the industry, how do you protect yourself against that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a great question. And um, the, the one thing that we talk about at the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State is really doing a good job documenting um, your standard operating procedures for your individual operation. The other way to protect yourself is to really document training and to have your people trained through the Beef Quality Assurance Program that was funded by checkoff dollars and is available online through the Animal Care Training website. Mm -hmm. um, and so that documentation of standard and operating procedures f um, for, you know, things like animal welfare, things like castration, you know, setting a, a target age where, where you will castrate and then having those documented and then having individuals trained um, using those SOPs and document it as well is probably the best way to protect yourself. One of the things that you mentioned today, and I, I don't think it's been mentioned very much at all, is producers talking to other producers. Mm -hmm. You know, if you see something wrong on your friend's farm, say something to your friend. Now, counterpoint, what if they don't want to be my friend anymore? Right. No, I think that that's a, that's a big issue, and that's really sort of how we talk about that shift of culture. You know, um, let's go back to the injection sites, because it was a successful shift. Um, you know, if, if you had a 
a operation and you were still giving injection sites in the rump and I was your friend, I might say, hey, have you thought about giving them in the neck? Do you know that I had X, Y, and Z fewer discounts when my cattle went to harvest last year? So, you know, not saying you're doing a bad job, but saying these are the things I changed and I saw improvements from an animal welfare perspective, um, from a food safety perspective, and also from an economic perspective. So there's sort of an, an incentive there. Kim was part of the Animal Welfare Conference held here at UNL in mid-February. The Beef Checkoff was created by cattle producers as part of the 1985 Farm Bill. This week, Market Journal's Curtis Harms examines the Beef Checkoff in Nebraska, which aids in beef promotion, research, and education. I think a lot of people ask the question about why are you telling us in Nebraska about beef? Bringing beef to the top of consumer awareness around the world and at home is an important goal with the Nebraska Beef Council. Since the beef checkoff was established in the mid-80s, checkoff dollars have been spent in a variety of ways to further promote the industry, according to Lisa Brass of the Nebraska Beef Council. Really, we have a safe, healthy, nutritious product. And no matter when we can tell that story, we want to make sure that people understand that. Get that message to the East Coast, the West Coast, where those folks maybe don't understand about farmers and ranchers, or even understand the health benefits of beef and the great things that we know about it. In addition to helping consumers better understand the beef industry, checkoff dollars are also used to address the health benefits of beef consumption. This research is important for an ever-increasing health-conscious society. We are working with, as we look at, um, we've got a new study called the Bull Diet, and it talks about beef and an optimal lean diet. And it's some great research. Um, the, the industry has worked very hard to get this research to put that heart healthy message with beef. So that is a huge push right now. Um, we also, as we continue to see um, the costs of beef rise, how we can help consumers to ensure that consumers understand the value of beef, the health benefits of beef, and making sure they're still buying it. Through partnerships with various ag entities, such as the Nebraska Department of Agriculture, beef checkoff dollars also play a role in global exports. One dollar for every beef animal sold contributes to the checkoff program. Even if cattle are sold between producers, checkoff fees still apply. We have collecting points across the state. Um, we have the brand inspectors in the western part, um, packers, auction markets, those folks are all collecting points. But even sales that happen from neighbor to neighbor, that's the responsibility of the producer to make sure that that money gets sent in. So there is some self-accountability in that program too. Beef producers have an opportunity to play an active role in the checkoff process in the near future. Five out of the nine districts of the Nebraska Beef Council are seeking directors. This includes districts 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. District directors can serve up to two four-year terms. Brass says producers interested in becoming a director must meet the minimum qualifications. You have to have been in the industry for the last five years and actively own cattle. Um, you have to be at least 21 years of age, and you have to live in the district that the election is held. So those are kind of the three big ones. Um, but there is a process that they go through. Um, they also have to receive 100 signatures from producers in their district just to say, yes, they are a producer, and we acknowledge that. This year, a pre-certification period is required for all producers wanting to vote in the election. Brass says this information can be found in upcoming industry publications or online at nebeef.org. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Curtis Harms. For individuals interested in becoming a district director with the Nebraska Beef Council, there are a number of candidate informational sessions being held throughout the state. These sessions will be held March 19th through the 21st in Wayne, Columbus, Kearney, Broken Bow, and Alliance. Visit nebeef.org for specific times and locations. UNL Extension educator Tim Levin says too often farmers and ranchers fail to extend a pat on the back to their employees. In the March Nebraska Farmer, Lemon says farm employees need to be properly compensated monetarily for their work, but they also should receive mental wages or positive feedback. You can read more about Lemon's and his thoughts on the employer-employee relationship in the March Nebraska Farmer. There's a rapid increase in the number of vehicles that can run on 85% ethanol, or E85. These vehicles are known as flexible fuel vehicles. Market Journal's Emily Doran reports on a campaign focused on increasing awareness for these flex fuel vehicles on the roads in Nebraska. 
A new National Flex Fuel Vehicle Awareness Campaign hopes to educate drivers about higher blends of ethanol fuel. The Nebraska Ethanol Industry Coalition is a part of the campaign and will create activities focused on reaching the National Renewable Fuel Standard. Nebraska Ethanol Board Administrator and Clean Fuels Development Coalition Chairman Todd Sneller says many consumers don't know what a flex fuel vehicle is and whether or not their vehicles are flex fuel compatible. Flex fuel vehicles are designed to use any blend of ethanol and gasoline up to 85 percent ethanol. And those fuel options are available at many pumps across Nebraska and throughout the nation. There are more than 9 million flex fuel vehicles on the road today across the country and about 120,000 of those vehicles are in Nebraska. Yet very few owners and operators of these vehicles are aware of that fact. Determining if your vehicle is a flex fuel vehicle isn't as hard as it seems. Clean Fuels Development Coalition Executive Director Doug Durante says there are a number of ways to verify if your vehicle is compatible with higher blends of ethanol. Well, we are trying to help people understand that in more recent years, the most obvious thing they've done is a yellow gas cap. If you open your gas flap and it usually says it uh, can use up to E85 percent ethanol. More recent cars also have what we call a badge, a little symbol on the back, either on the tailgate or uh, right above the trunk lid or something like that that might say flex fuel, flex fuel vehicle, flex fuel capable, something like that. The increased production of ethanol has created jobs and provided an alternative use for corn grown in Nebraska. This has led to rural development across the state and nationwide. Durante says ethanol supply in the United States is greater than our supply of imported oil from any other country, with the exception of Canada. So it's, it's a major player. It's a big guy in the, in the world of fuel, and with that comes a lot of benefits. As a, a, the tax generation, so many small towns in Nebraska, it really has saved them. It really has helped put uh, tax dollars back into the system. So it's important that we not only keep that demand up, but now we have an opportunity to go to a whole nother phase. At 85%, we can use a lot more and uh, we could get even more benefits. There are many partners working together to ensure the success of this campaign, which is being funded through a grant awarded by the USDA. The Nebraska Ethanol Board and a number of other partners are trying to make sure that we're working together with all those who are interested in accomplishing the goal of increased production and use of ethanol. The U.S. Department of Agriculture Rural Development Program provided incentives and funding for some of the blender pumps that offer these diverse ethanol fuels. And so it was in their interest to make sure that people who drove the vehicles that would use those fuels actually got to the fueling sites and exercised those choices. Benefits from ethanol production and use don't stop at Nebraska's state line. Ethanol is beginning to positively impact consumers nationwide even outside of the Midwest. We're trying to make sure that Nebraska's rich history and experience in consumer advocacy for ethanol fuels is understood outside the Midwest. What we're trying to do with our ethanol advocacy groups is to highlight the fact that consumers have these vehicles, use point of sale promotions and other means of creating awareness about those vehicles, and to encourage consumers to try out these fuel options. For more information about the use of ethanol or to see if you drive a flex fuel vehicle, visit NE dash ethanol dot org. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Emily Dorn. Thanks, Emily. Drivers can confirm if their car is a flex fuel vehicle or FFV by checking their owner's manual or visiting the Nebraska Ethanol Board website at ne dash ethanol dot org slash FFV. And now to forecast the next seven days, here's UNL Extension statewide climatologist Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we are again on Friday morning. This turned out to be a very warm week with several days of record set across the state early in the week as we uh, breached the 80-degree mark. As we go forward, we do have a large, rather large storm system moving into the western United States that is going to give us a fairly decent shot of possibly seeing some severe weather, particularly in central Nebraska, as we move into the early part of the week. Uh, outside of that, the major concern at this point in time is this rapid warm-up is really starting to get things firing up in terms of growth. We're starting to see trees break dormancy. Um, I would be very, very nervous and if you have any fruit crops out there because we're now going to have to go essentially frost-free for the remainder of the spring in order to safely ensure that we do get proper pollination. And of course, the other thing we're worried about is in southern Kansas, the wheat crop has now reached a joining stage and a big Arctic outbreak any time in the next few weeks could cause some significant damage to the wheat crop. 
Do we have any cold wear air in the forecast? Well, let's take a look at the upper air models and see what we have in storage and move through this next seven day period. And as we go to the upper air models, what we're going to notice is we're pretty much dominant with high pressure aloft in the southeast and we have a monstrous trough that's going to rapidly move into the western United States. But for the next few days, we're really not going to be dealing with much in the way of any precipitation chances outside extreme southeast or in Nebraska as there may be some moisture pooling up. Uh, with a little stationary funnel boundary at the surface. It may generate some thunderstorm activity, but overall, pretty fairly dry forecast. Um, we're looking at probably upper 70s to low 80s, pretty consistent with the last few days. And as we go into tomorrow, we are going to notice that the ridge does shift a little bit farther east. The, the trough starts to dig down. But again, the southwest flow in the upper atmospheres and the southerly flow from the south is probably going to keep us well into the upper 70s to low 80s. And again, chance of isolated thunderstorm activity over the overnight hours in southeast Nebraska. And as we get into Sunday, now we see this trough starting to pivot closer toward the uh, southern plains. And so we're still going to see a fairly decent moisture fetch and very warm temperatures once again on Sunday. Highs in the upper 70s to low 80s. And we might start to see some thunderstorms moving in late Sunday into portions of southern Nebraska, carrying on into Monday. But the real action starts to begin as we get into Monday, as we see this deep trough and a big parallel fetch so that where if we do get thunderstorm development, we're going to see it training over the same area. So there's the potential for some significant severe weather, particularly Monday afternoon moving out into uh, western Kansas, western Oklahoma. That may cut some of this moisture off, but overall we do see an increasing chance for thunderstorm activity from west to east. And as we get into Tuesday, this is where we expect the biggest chance for severe weather. We may see a very significant outbreak Kansas southward, and if it gets going, it may rob some of the moisture in Nebraska, but we do have the chance for severe thunderstorms developing in central Nebraska rapidly moving eastward. And as we go into Wednesday, this low cuts off, and this is going to be the trick where it goes, and that may determine our forecast. Well, right now, it's indicated it's going to move up towards southeast Nebraska, so it's going to drop our temperatures in the mid-50s to the east to the low 60s across the west, and on Thursday that low starts to pivot toward the Great Lakes, so there's a chance of shower activity. And as we get to the 8 to 14 day forecast, we see a return to the warmth, and in terms of precipitation, a drier pattern starts to move in as we go into next weekend. Thanks, Al. Next week, we'll report from Grays Harbor in the Pacific Northwest as part of the Nebraska Soybean Board's See For Yourself program. Grays Harbor plays a vital role in shipping Nebraska soybeans to international buyers in Asia and the Black Sea region. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. A diesel powered engine on a farm works hard and operates in a grueling environment. Soy biodiesel fuels stand up to the challenge of powering farm equipment, but are also renewable and environmentally responsible as well. The Nebraska Soybean Board is committed to encouraging the use of soy biodiesel to protect the environment and sustain Nebraska's agriculture. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.